Good evening, everyone. My name is Tina Pierce Fragoso. I'm the Associate Dean of Equity and Access for the Penn Undergraduate Admissions Office. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're so excited to have a chance to talk with you, but also to have a chance to have a candid and engaging conversation with some of Penn's most influential leaders. These women are highly respected and admired for the work that they do and who they are, and we're honored to hear from them as part of our Women's History Celebration. And I find myself personally inspired by each and every one of them. Before we get started, I'd like to do a quick land acknowledgement. I'd like to, even though we're in a virtual space, Penn sits on the traditional homelands of the Lenape Lenape, and we're thankful to be able to live and learn in Lenape Hokan, which is land of the Lenape. Native people, Lenape people are still here. And I'm proud to say that I'm a citizen of the Nanakok, Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation, and I'm grateful every day to live and work in my traditional homelands. This evening, we're gonna introduce each of the um, panelists today, give them a chance to, to share a little bit about their stories, their journeys, and we'll introduce you to them one at a time. And um, as my colleague said, you'll have a chance to um, ask questions through the Q&A uh, and also to just listen um, feel inspired and also to just join in with this conversation through your questions. And I'm pleased to start off the panel um, with a, a new friend of mine, um, our new Vice Provost for University Life, Mamta Akapati. Um, you've dedicated your career to diversity inclusion work in higher education, to social justice issues, um, issues impacting women of color. I know you personally have impacted me already in, in your short time at the university and so delighted that you're here to join us today. So would you um, please share a little bit about yourself, um, your role here at Penn, very important role here at Penn, and also some of that sort of personal and professional journey that's brought you to us. Oh my gosh, um, thank you, Tina, for your generous introduction. And I just, what a gift to be in community with um, the uh, all, all of us, the, just this amazing uh, set of panelists. Like this, this is a gift to be in community with this amazing collective of women. Um, my role at Penn is as, um, you know, the, I started in August as the Vice Provost for University Life. And you know, I, I chuckle because you know, my, 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 you see my degrees on this slide, my degree, you know, undergrad degrees in microbiology. I studied biochemistry as well. And my parents wanted me to be a medical doctor, right? Because that's, you know, they wanted me to have a career and a life that would transcend any sort of cultural barrier. And, and so um, I um, know what it was like to kind of struggle with career choices, with family pressure um, and, you know, cultural expectations, all of those things in college. And I really struggled. And so um, I'm really thankful to be in this position now. And so what kind of changed my career from, you know, uh, medicine, I say I went from one healing profession to another. Um, as an educator, I think of myself as somebody who works alongside so many people in service of our students um, to make sure that you all are able uh, to uh, create your best life, you know, with the experiences that you have, that you find joy, that you ask the tough questions, that you meet people that are different from you. Um, and that you have just a joyful, um, you know, and challenging experience, um, knowing that people are here to support um, the students along the way. So, um, you know, that's the reflection that I'll offer for now. Um, I, you know, I was also drawn to Penn because I wanted to be in a community where students were asking tough questions, right? Students are asking questions about representation and accessibility and diversity issues. And I wanted to be in a community where I get to serve and learn from the brilliance um, of, of our students and our whole community. So thank you for having me here. Thank you so much. Our next guest here is Michelle Rainey, the Director of Advancing Women in Engineering at Penn. Um, you have a distinguished record of leadership at Penn and several other universities where you've consistently uplifted the voices of women. Um, it's such an important role. Um, same question, basically, um, would you share us a little bit about yourself and your role here at Penn um, and some of the personal and professional journey that's led you to Penn? Thank you, Tina, for, for having me and welcome everyone to our Penn community this evening. Uh, my name is Michelle Rainey. I'm the Director of Advancing Women in Engineering in the School of Engineering. I'm also one of the professional academic advisors and I manage one of our scholars programs in engineering. Like the show, um, West Philadelphia, born and raised, 
I am a first generation college student. I came from humble beginnings in terms of very limited resources. I attended college and graduate school in New England, as you can see on my slide, because I love snow and cold weather, which I know is an anomaly for a lot of people, but that was my criteria in terms of trying to figure out where to go to school. I, like I said, I didn't know much, uh, but I know a little bit more today. During my collegiate experience, I didn't have a lot of women who look like me with similar backgrounds. I firmly believe that it would have made a difference in terms of how I felt on campus, in terms of how I navigated struggles outside of the classroom. When people ask me what I do, I often say that I'm an educator who uses the lens of social work to guide students to success in and outside of the classroom. I always knew that I wanted to return to higher ed and it was an effort and perseverance to get back here after being a licensed clinical social worker for the first half of my career. I started my higher ed career at a historically black university where they took my raw material and shaped me into a very proficient student affairs professional. I moved on to a women's institution where I was exposed to the best practices of support for women in STEM fields. And it led me to Penn Engineering where I can kind of put all of those tools together to guide students to success in and outside of the classroom. I like to offer, I want to offer to students what was missing to me, which was representation during my collegiate experience. The empowerment of women has been the theme of my career in higher ed, and I'm very proud and inspired to continue this work. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you so much, and, and for being so generous with your story. And I know we're just starting to get to know each other, but um, one of my dear friends recommended you when I was talking about influential women. Um, so I just wanted to share that little note with you as well. In fact, each of you that are here today were recommended by someone who's close to me, close to the equity and access team here on campus. And so um, that's the bond that you all share tonight besides being on this panel and we're very grateful. And so now um, in the middle of midterms, we have three students that were able to generously give their time to us as well. And um, they're also coming from different fields and in different years at Penn as well. And so um, our first is Ashley Codner. Um, Ashley, if you could just introduce yourself, maybe tell us a little bit about the school, the major minors, you know, a little bit about the involvements um, and things that keep you busy and inspired at Penn. Yes, um, I'm Ashley. I'm a senior at Penn, majoring in English, minoring in consumer psychology and jazz and popular music studies. Um, on campus, I am a big and um, on the board for Penn's chapter of Big Brothers Big Sisters. I'm a instructor for City Step. I love working with kids, so I'm an instructor for City Step. Um, I'm on the club soccer team to the extent that that can be done in a pandemic. Um, I am um, a member and the chapter president of our chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated as well. And I'm also um, a fellow for the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Ashley. That's some resume. Oh my goodness. And what a career here at Penn as you're, you're into your final semester here. That's very exciting. Um, our next panelist is Melina Lopez. Um, same question, Melina. If you could tell us a little bit about your school, your major, majors, minors, um, a description of how you're involved here at Penn. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Melina Lopez. I like to go by Mel. Um, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. I use she, they pronouns. And I'm a junior in the nursing school, uh, minoring in gender, sexuality, women's studies. Um, on campus, I'm involved in a couple of things. I work in the School of Nursing's Office of Institutional Advancement um, and am part of three organizations. I'm president of Minorities and Nursing Organization, which is a support and empowerment group for um, student nurses of color here on campus. I'm also treasurer for Mujeres Empoderadas, which is a Latina and femme identifying Latinx empowerment group here on campus. And I'm also a member and treasurer for Sigma Lambda Upsilon, Senoritas Latinas Unidas Sorority Incorporated, which is um, a Latina based but not Latina exclusive Greek letter or a consisted of a diverse set of collegiate professional women dedicated to uplift and serve marginalized communities. Thank you, Melina. I don't know if you can see my face, but it just gets bigger and bigger with a smile, just really, you know, 
uh, embracing the, the energy that you all have and um, the stories that you're all sharing. Um, our next and final panelist for this evening is Lauren McDonald. Um, same thing, I, I have to say, I already know Lauren a little bit from working with her in, in some capacities, but I'm anxious to have her share a little bit about her story, um, brief description of the things that she's involved with and passionate about both academically and um, outside of her academic work. Hey everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Lauren McDonald Longboat. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am currently a sophomore in the Wharton School thinking of studying finance and business analytics. And a couple of things I'm involved in on campus is Natives at Penn, Muse, which is a marketing club, the PD Green program where I'm able to tutor incarcerated people. And I'm also working at Bridges to Wealth at the Netter Center, um, helping the financial literacy program. Thank you so much, Lauren. And again, thank you all for joining us today. And now, um, while you're still generating questions on your side um, for our, um, our guests tonight, I have a couple of questions that I have directly for each of our panelists as well. And the first one is for Mamta. And this is really, and in my experience working with you, I've witnessed your very open and inclusive way of working with the Penn community. And as we seek to honor um, women's history and voices in this conversation, can you please share us with us a little bit of the vision you have for uplifting and supporting the amazing women of the Penn community? Um, sure. Um, thank you, Tina, for this question. And you know, um, you know, I, it's such a powerful question because I uh, any any transformation that we've seen in human existence doesn't happen with one person and a vision. It happens because there is a collective of people coming together, right? And so for me, um, again, as I shared in the introduction, why I'm so drawn to this community is you, I mean, just listen to this amazing panel, right? I mean, our student leaders and just uh, like, they're transforming the world already. I mean, uh, we have uh, two culturally based Greek letter organizations, right? You know, represented, we have, you know, upliftment based on financial literacy. We have, um, you know, identity-based work and profession. Um, and, and so, it's all of these actions that our leaders are taking to strengthen the collective. All of that in aggregate is empowering um, the women of the Penn community. So I wanna be somebody who is an amplifier of the excellence that other people are, are doing and bringing to the table. I think, you know, uh, we all play uh, different roles in a campus or in any community, right? So I think of myself, like I'm not particular, like, I don't have so many gifts and talents, but what I do bring is, um, so imagine like a necklace. So I tell the story quite a bit, right? A necklace has gemstones on them. And so like wh when, I'm, when I'm looking at Michelle, I'm looking at you know, uh, Melina and Ashley and Lauren and you um, and, and all of us that are supporting this event, right? You're all gemstones on this beautiful necklace, but gemstones in isolation are just a single gemstone. I like being the clasp on the necklace. Right, And so I think it's really important when we're thinking about empowering women, it's how can we be the connector and how can we be someone that, that, that amplifies and connects to, you know, to, to see how our aggregate greatness makes everyone better. And so I, I, and I, I offer the gratitude to my elders and gratitude to young people that are modeling the way and challenging us and asking us tough questions. So I, I, I don't know if I singular, I am confident that I singularly don't necessarily have a vision. I am learning from our students um, and hope that I can amplify their voice and wisdom um, into a broad space so that their wisdom can do that work of empowering women. Thank you so much. Um, really, you know, helpful for all of us really to think about how we can amplify the voices of those around us. Uh, that's, I think, word that will stick with me for a while as I think about the work um, that we have to do or that I have to do also in my individual space. Um, so thank you. Um, next, my question is for Michelle. Um, the Penn School of Engineering has an average of 40% women in each class, which is really remarkable. Um, as an admissions professional, we say this all the time to the people that we're recruiting. Um, and in the back of my head, I'm like, wow, that's really remarkable. How does this happen? Um, the national average is, you know, closer to 22%. And then seeing someone in your position, um, it's easier to see how this is sort of evident. But I wanted to ask you directly, like, how do you see that 
uh, why these um, numbers are so different and what opportunities in particular do your, does your leadership role help provide support to women um, as they navigate Penn and the engineering space? Thank you for the question, Tina. We are super proud of our numbers in engineering as it relates to the recruitment and the retention of women in engineering. You know, I think that there are a few factors that kind of lend itself to this particular um, statistic, so to speak. Uh, you know, Penn Engineering, we don't exist in a vacuum, right? Um, the student who comes to Penn is someone who wants a more interdisciplinary approach to their engineering education. You know, Penn is a place that allows you exposure to a variety of different disciplines. You can take course courses and coursework in three other undergraduate schools. You can conduct uh, research not only with our faculty in engineering, but faculty in arts and sciences, or even the medical school. It, it really allows you to integrate your engineering education in an everyday applied fashion. So I really think that that is the hallmark of a Penn engineering education and, and why we are attractive to a particular kind of student. You know, we're not MIT, we're not Georgia Tech, you know, we're not Harvard, we're Penn Engineering, and we're very proud of that. And we're very proud to be a part of the Penn community in that way. I think the leadership of Advancing Women in Engineering, you know, we strive to create an environment that is supportive from the very beginning. We offer a pre-orientation program for our incoming first year women so that they can get to know their peers. They can get to know older upper class women who can give them tips and strategies about how to navigate this thing called engineering education. It's not easy. It's, it's built to be hard and difficult and challenging, but it isn't something that you can't be successful. Um, we have alumni donations that allow for support of undergraduate in, uh, summer research. We have programmatic activity that is led by our student advisory board, which helps to create community. And the literature, you know, pretty much reads that access to research, building community, uh, networking opportunities with alums and with companies and, you know, to, to kind of think about career development, that is what leads to a stronger number in terms of retention. You know, we promote and we're very proud of the idea and the fact that students are able to build close relationships with their faculty. Our faculty advisors are assigned to students once they declare a major. So again, in terms of building community, not only with peers, but building community in terms of faculty, which can then become mentors and then can kind of help that particular process in terms of having a student mature and kind of grow into their engineering legs, so to speak. So, you know, those are the factors I think that really contribute to our numbers and we're super proud, but you know, we're a work in progress. We're not 50%, <laughs> we're not above 50%. Um, there's still room to grow. And I feel very confident that the leadership that we have in Penn Engineering is working very hard to continue to expand upon those particular numbers. Thank you so much. Um, what a comprehensive answer. I think anybody who's considering engineering out there um, really has a lot of it, really great information to kind of look into. And um, I certainly have some information now that I'll share with my colleagues in Penn Admission too. But um, again, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, my next question is for Ashley. Um, in addition to your English um, and multiple sort of minors, you've done a lot of work, significant work in oral history and research with local change makers. Um, the history of social justice work in Philadelphia, sort of as women of color, as people of color, in particular, history is a really hard thing to, um, you know, we're underrepresented for sure in this field in many different ways. Um, so when I read your resume and heard stories about you as well, just got really excited about your work and hoping you can tell us a little bit more about that and also how it connects to, you know, you're doing these outside projects that are around, you know, something that's not English per se, but something that's connected. So how does this sort of academic and personal experience um, sort of interact at Penn? 
Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, I'm currently interning with Scribe Video Center, which is um, a nonprofit org here in Philly um, that uses arts media, arts based media um, as a mechanism for progressive social change. So I'm currently working with them on their power politics project, which uh, conducts oral history uh, in order to create a eventually at least um, a documentary highlighting the history of um, community organizing in Philly from 1945 to 2015. So uh, I got into it because um, I found it, I think I found um, the listing on Maku's emailing listserv and Maku is um, a support center for uh, black students at Penn. And I knew I wanted to do it um, practically because I want to be in academia. I hope to be in academia, specifically in black studies um, professionally. So this just made sense. And it was an opportunity to sort of expand my professional capacity because you know I, I would say that I'm a writer um, by nature and primarily, but oral history work is also something that's really important. Um, and you know because oral history is really rooted in um, black culture. So, so just practically it made sense. But also I think personally, it's been really amazing to hear from these people um, who are citizen activists. You know, they're they're doing the work because they care, because they care about themselves and their families and their livelihoods, but also because they care about the communities and the place that they called home. Um, and I think as a Penn student, something that I was taught as an, un, as, an um, as an underclassman and something that I try to do now is to get outside of Penn. Um, and I think a lot of Penn students can really stay stuck within a Penn bubble. And that can be, you know, the geographic boundaries of Penn, but it can also be just the mind state. You know, you're just, you're focusing on yourself, your studies, your classes. Um, and, you know, that's that's understandable, but you're also entering into this really rich city and which with so much history and so much black history. Um, and this, this project is really highlighting that, that history um, that kind of gets lost both because of just the national uh, rhetoric of, you know, national civil rights history, but also because um, of just the greater names like, you know, MLK, the sort of big singular people that we think of when we think of um, civil rights work. And then also because that's just the nature, as you were saying, that's the nature of um, Black people's relationships with history, you know, we're not really included in it. So it's really an opportunity to highlight it, to highlight it um, in a really rigorous and important way. And it's going to be housed at Temple's um, Blocks and Archives. So hopefully it will be um, a tool for instruction in the years to come. And I'll also say that, um, what was I going to say? But yeah, I've just felt really, really poured into by it um, personally. Just it's, it's really inspired and invigorated um, my desire to highlight Black voices and to, you know, continue uh, to be subversive and, you know, to speak out. It's amazing to, to hear these people and hear their stories and hear um, the things that they went through, which are which are both so similar and so different for me. Um, but I think it's been a great way to learn more about Philly, um, which is a place that I've called home for the past four years. Um, and, and I don't really know much about, unfortunately. So it's definitely been a great way to um, expand my knowledge and just expand um, my capacity as a social justice worker. What a remarkable story. Um, I, I'm just almost at a loss for words. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And also let, let that be a sort of a, an ex one example of how Penn students really do have that opportunity to, to make a significant impact in the community, you know, in the Philadelphia area to add, you know, culturally um, to the stories that are offered and um, available to share that different perspective that's not been available. Um, and to think about like the academic work, you know, complements sort of those things that you do outside the classroom. I think that's just a really remarkable example of um, how your soul can sort of be fed as you do the, the academic work, some of the work that, you know, you like more than other, but, um, you know, thank you for that story. My next question is for Melina. Um, in addition to pursuing a nursing degree and a minor in gender, sexuality and women's studies, you're also the president of the Minorities and Nursing Organization at Penn. And so how have organizations like this shaped your experience in Penn, helped inform the work that you're doing and the work that you hope to do in nursing? And also taking into consideration also the field of nursing is highly underrepresented with um, women of, well, of, of people of color. 
Um, and so this leadership plays a really significant role um, in our nursing program, I know, but I'm anxious to hear more about your experience with this. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I think overall, like before seeing how these organizations like shape my experience, there's a really like um, fulfilling story, I guess, of how I've been able to come like become aware about these organizations and then becoming involved. Um, so like, I guess a little bit of backstory, I came from a predominantly black and brown high school. And so coming to a predominantly white institution, it was a really big culture um, shock for me. So um, I wasn't too involved directly on executive boards. When I first came into Penn, I was more like a general body member. Um, and La Casa really like was home to me. La Casa is the Latinx and Hispanic Excellence Center and support um, environment, um, the, the resource for um, Penn students. And so within that community, I was really able to kind of like begin to find my voice um, just because I never had to fight for a seat at the table um, in high school. So that was something I had to learn rather quickly. And so um, my spring semester, I joined Mujeres and being a part of that organization just really gave me like the confidence to continue exploring what my other interests were, as well as really exploring my different identities, because that's something I find really important. Um, in Penn, like you have your academic, you know, aspirations, but you also have a lot of different passions that extend extracurricularly and then involved in your work and um, involving what you want to do in the community. So. It's a really fulfilling journey. Um, and so being a part of such organizations has helped me in so many ways. Um, one, I was able to find my community first, finding these organizations, you know, that I feel at home with. I'm able to vent in these spaces um, or ask for advice, especially if um, people who are older than me or like the grades above the grades above me are also like in those environments with me. Um, but then being part of the executive board is particularly fulfilling because I learn more about the people who share the board experiences with me and gain like an appreciation for the many different intersecting identities and experiences of those who are present. Um, and I guess in terms of the work that I'm currently doing, I think this year has been really powerful in kind of like propelling and fueling those certain passions of mine. So um, like to preface during my sophomore year, I learned that I want to be a public health nurse who focuses on women's and gender related health. So um, with the ongoing pandemic and last year's Black Lives Matter protests and just still the overall like political state we're in, um, I've really been able to explore my academic passions through my social awareness and like advocacy. So it's not just, I mean, I'm able to do this. Um, and overall being involved in these organizations, I'm able to ensure that, you know, I'm catering towards my many different identities and, um, you know, like whether it be my identity as a nursing student or as a film identifying Latinx or a collegiate professional, um, I'm really appreciative of the opportunities that I've been able um, to take part of and host and just overall, like continue to contribute in the name of, you know, civic engagement. Thank you so much, Melina. And um, what a really great thing to kind of remind everyone of that you don't have to sacrifice your identity to go to college, that you can really incorporate that in many different ways. And in some ways you can sort of um, re renew yourself, right? To explore other parts of yourself that maybe you haven't had that opportunity to do. And again, that happens inside and outside the classroom. And so Melina, thank you for that. And also, um, you know, for that service that you're doing, we now I think know more than ever, you know, those um, frontline workers and people that are really like holding the lives of other people in their hands. And so um, thank you for that service piece that you're doing. And in addition to the other civic engagement pieces that you're involved with. And so my next question is for Lauren. Um, Lauren, I think we share in common both being Native Americans and as a Native student, you've definitely had a really remarkable visible leadership profile in the community. Um, in addition to your work with Wharton, you've been leading some pretty big initiatives with Natives of Penn and pushing for some really important changes in our community as well. And can you tell me a little bit about the importance of this work and um, the meaning it's going to have for Indigenous people, but also for the Penn community? Of course. So one of the things that I left or that I brought coming to Penn, leaving home, was that I really wanted to do something that was going to either uplift my community, my friends, my family. And I believe that Penn allows you to have that platform to really go after your ambitions, go after whatever your goal and mission is. And so one of the initi first initiatives that I was able to lead 
was calling for Penn to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. And for those who may not know what it is, it is a day that acknowledges the resilience of Native people, celebrating our past and our future. I started speaking about this plan um, with alumni, with Tina, with Natives at Penn, where I was able to create a petition along with an essay explaining the initiative and having this day recognized. Um, I was happy to see that just under 2,000 signatures of the Penn community, people were supporting it and signing it. And the main goal was that this was just to take one step in pushing for Native visibility on Penn's campus, up, um, uplifting the Lenape community, um, and also each member's nation who are part of Natives at Penn. And so starting with this initiative, it was really the goal to move towards creating a space on campus that will increase our awareness, increase our presence, and make students here feel that they're accepted and that we have the administration supporting us. So while this initiative is still in the works and hoping to come together in the fall when Indigenous Peoples Day is, um, it has also opened the door for Natives at Penn to be more vocal and to be more connected um, including the work that we've been starting with Mamta, who hasn't forgotten about us, who's been eager to always work with us um, and provide us again with the platform and roadmap for myself and anyone else in Natives at Penn to start continuing advocating for what we wish to see on campus. So my goal is to continue advocating for the resources and needs of our group, not only for ourselves in the couple of years that we're here, um, but really with the goal for Native students to feel like there's a place for them here on campus um, if they choose to come here and take advantage of the opportunities and also to feel that they aren't going to be forgotten or silenced, but that they can fully express themselves without having to feel that they have to conform to something they aren't. Thank you so much, Lauren. And thank you for, um, one, I have to personally thank you for the piece of with the Lenape people, the honoring of Lenape people. It's, um, as you stated, just letting people know that we're here and you know, as Native people and that um, we have a presence in communities and importance too. And so thank I wanna personally thank you for that too. And, and all of you have really just um, shared some really wonderful stories. And I think you've given the audience a really good sense uh, of like the communities at Penn and, the, and why we chose you as some of the influential and prominent women of Penn. Um, we have an audience that's coming from pretty much all over the world. Um, and so now we're gonna like, give them a chance to um, direct some questions to you. And so if you haven't already done so, we've, um, we're gonna select some questions from the Q&A and then um, see where this takes us. So there's a question for Michelle. Um, how did you get into working with engineering from sociology or social work degree? <laughs> and also, they want to know how, uh, Mamta, why you switched or how you switched careers as well. So Michelle, first to you. That's, that's a funny question. Um, <laughs> uh, the reason I say that is uh, back in 2014, yeah, it was 2014, right at Thanksgiving, I had told my family like, oh, I got this new job. I'm gonna be working at Penn Engineering. I was just leaving my previous institution. And my mother re leaned over the table and said, they do know that you're not an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I'm pretty sure it came up in the interview. I think we're, we're good to go with that. Um, so I think what, what is the thread that ties sociology, social work, and to being a, a, an, a student affairs professional and administrator in higher education is my, are my counseling skills and the ability to, to, to kind of understand where people are, where they start and to give them hope and understanding and to help them see that there's a future beyond where, where they stop, right? Or where someone told them they need it to stop. I think that I approach my work with a lens of social justice, with a lens of equity that really harkens back to my social work roots, but also harkens back to my collegiate experience in terms of the, the tenets from my institution and my even my K through 12 uh, in terms of the type of schooling that I had attended. So, you know, service to others, um, service for, for yourself, service for others, and things like that. So it was a hard road to get into higher ed from being a social worker. A lot of schools were like, I don't understand the connection. So I really had to be my own advocate. And I can share that with students as well in terms of if this is something that you want, you got to work hard to get it. And if people tell you no, you just keep asking until someone tells you yes. And then once you kick the door and they'll look at you and go, why didn't I ask you to come through the door sooner? And you're like, I know. 
So uh, that's my story. That's how I kind of did it. Wonderful. <laughs> that's a beautiful story, Michelle. Um, you know, I think about, you know, uh, for all I knew growing up, um, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. And I realized that that was just a message that my parents had kind of fed me, right? So from the point that I could talk and walk, she's going to be a doctor, right? I, but I want to rewind back to where that comes from. You know, my parents were immigrants, um, are immigrants, so they've been here about 50 years at this point, but um, came to this country as immigrants. And I grew up um, with my father on and off again, unemployed, my, you know, um, and so, you know, early in my childhood, um, you know, we just had a, 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 I would say a lower income journey, um, lower middle class journey. And, and so that the kind of the, the status of our class status would fluctuate, right? B depending on kind of the circumstance. Um, and uh, as my father um, finally um, had stability, um, he got a position. He said he got a job as an admit, uh, he used to be a lab tech. So um, back in the day, I don't know if we still have computer labs on, on campuses, um, but like, you know, there were big computer labs like in engineering schools. And so the, the person who would like clean up the computers and take care of, you know, so, so I was, uh, I've, I've always been on college campus. At one point, um, I grew up on an HBCU campus, Prairie View A&M in um, outside of Houston, Texas. Um, and so I'd always kind of been around higher education, um, but my parents did not know how to navigate U.S. higher education. Um, uh, it just is. So wh while I feel very fortunate in some ways, I just didn't necessarily know how to navigate those things. And so, you know, what, what one assumes is, okay, to be a medical doctor, you must study science and these are the things that you must do. And I just kind of inherited that. And, you know, when you come to college, you have this opportunity to talk with faculty mentors and advisors and all of these people. So everyone listen to what Michelle just said, right? Because there are people like her and all the different schools to help, you know, you understand the intersections of your hopes and dreams and your identity, right? All of those things and to disrupt, you know, the messages you might've heard. Um, I, so I'm a product of having inherited certain messages and our families try to do the best for us, right? So as a daughter in a very strict family, it was my duty, right? The eldest, the first, you know, all of those things. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know how to challenge that duty. Um, it was a hard thing, I, you know, good Indian girls don't rebel against their family, right? And, and it wasn't meant to be rebellion to kind of have your choice, but those things really felt that way at that time in my life. Um, and family is everything. So, uh, but again, that comes from this cultural truth. My parents didn't know any better, right? They wanted the best for their children. And so were like, they were like, this will bring stability to your life. We didn't have that. And we want you to have that. All that being said, I also have to chuckle because, uh, because of the way that I grew up, you know, <laughs> confession, I learned how to forge my parents' signature when I was fourth grade, fifth grade, because guess what? I was reading all the forms and signing all, like I signed my brother's report, like signed report cards. I was the one doing all of that stuff. I was the one talking to credit card companies on the phone at that. Like I was the one doing those navigating things at such an early age. Um, I would, I would get pulled out of class to go to PTA meetings for my brothers. Right. So think about like the, the wayfinding that has kind of like, I look back and I'm like, people are curious as to how I ended up in higher education where I am supporting the wayfinding of students. I've done it my whole life. Um, and I really find joy in helping um, minimize barriers for people and helping students find their joy because I felt like I fell through the cracks. Um, and so I think about that a lot, even with caring and loving friends and mentors, I fell through the cracks. And so I just, I think about that a lot. And so I've, you know, happened to land upon mentors who helped me realize I like the, I like the helping part of medicine, right? And so I took the parts I liked. I like the helping. I like the teaching. And then talking to mentors to say, what about that do you like? And then how do you translate that into uh, the career of choice? So I think it's it's uh, this is a time where we're going to be vulnerable in college. It's also a time where we get to be courageous um, and and surround yourself with your, you know. You heard our student leaders talk about their peers and their organizations, older students, advisors, mentors. That's that's the whole beauty of, of being in a community to, to learn from so many people that can help you along the way. Thank you so much. And now we have a question for the, um, actually each of the students. And it's really um, 
can you share some insights of what it's like being a minority female at an Ivy League institution? And so I don't know if anybody wants to go first or if you want to maybe Melina, would you like to take a stab at that? For sure. Um, so like I previously mentioned, you know, um, first navigating my experience as a person of color was something I never really had to do in high school. So that was like a really big part um, of my pen experience and it still is. Um, in terms of like my identity as a woman, I think within the nursing school, it's been a lot easier just because nursing is a very gendered profession. So I haven't really had to face too much, um, I guess, tension in terms of like the faculty involved and the professors just because that is, you know, a female and women uh, dominated field. So um, still just going out to like the broader community though. Um, whenever you do take like courses in you know, like the college. Um, I haven't taken any courses, you know, within Wharton or engineering, but um, I definitely do see like those power shifts be made. And it's a little difficult to navigate when you're not, you know, when you're not comfortable in those experiences. And so finding your voice, I think was really difficult for me at first, but um, I, I feel like I've been able to kind of navigate it through mentorship asking the people who are above me um i was able to make like really good friends with a few latina nurses as soon as i got to campus and they were above me so um honestly it was a very personal level um i, I was able to create a lot of personal level relationships um and their guidance really helped me just because these terrains were so new for me and having that guidance was really um beneficial for me yeah i think Melina mentioned a good point about mentorship. Um, I would say that I, it was definitely a struggle um, coming into Penn just because I had a lot of imposter syndrome um, and coming from a predominantly white high school, like it was just something that I was tired of dealing with, um, with you know, always having to experience. But I think I just tried to, uh, one, only entertain spaces that welcomed me and, you know, um, entertain people that, you know, I found, you know, warm and welcoming. Uh, so that has helped just keeping, you know, good energy around you. It's important. Um, and then secondly, it's just helped me um, as I sort of developed, got old, the confidence to realize that like I deserve to be in every school that I enter. And when you have, you know, when you have that confidence, then you don't tolerate anything that you deal with because you're going to deal with it. Um, that's just the nature of the world. But, you know, it's just recognizing that that's their ignorance and that's their problem. Um, and you could, you know, you go about doing what you need to do to graduate and to succeed. And, you know, you let them do whatever they want to. Thank you. I don't know, Lauren, if you'd like to add your perspective. Yeah, I can say um, it definitely was a culture shock coming to Penn. Um, it was very different. At times it was challenging, um, just figuring academics out, figuring how to kind of go about the culture and everything, but um, you definitely overcome it. And there are definitely people, um, other women on campus, um, faculty, um, other professors who are willing to guide you along the way um, and are always there to support you. So. It makes the process a lot easier, but there will be some some struggles, as others have mentioned. But it's nothing that nobody cannot overcome. Thank you. So the next question, um, probably geared towards Lamsa or Michelle, in terms of uplifting women on college campuses, what are some ways in which universities like Penn still have some work to do? Well, so I am new here. So I've been here for about seven months. So I wanna offer that probably 100% of my colleagues here on this call um, can do a much better job than, than me um, in answering this question. I guess what I would say is that um, I think we need to be more intersectional um, in how we define womanhood um, and how we think about, and, and our student leaders have already talked about this kind of just their, their lived truths, right? Have, have articulated both um, how um, they have navigated those things and, and co-created those experiences for themselves, but also the mentors and the cultural resource centers and also their organizations um, kind of have been those communities um, for them. But I, I think that, um, you know, 
when everyone is cared, like when our most marginalized populations are cared for, everyone automatically benefits, right? So when we think about our most vulnerable populations, and so add, you know, intersections of identities um, and historically minoritized identities, if we can hold sacred those identities that those students can live and be with dignity, then that means we're considering, like we're, we're, we're expanding what we consider to be the center. There are then no people on the margins, right? So um, from a, like, uh, I guess our disability studies colleagues would call this a universal design approach around identity and, and inclusion. So I think that's a space that we could think about, um, you know, for a long time, um, and I'm not, uh, I can't speak to Penn, but in general, you know, my academic backgrounds are in Asian American and women's studies. And in women's studies, I have generally found those spaces to be, uh, you know, either very white or um, um, very cisgender or very, and very cishet in nature. And so, um, I, you know, I, I really appreciate, I, I love our Women's Center. You know, you, you'll see a very intersectional representation of identities across the board. And that, and that gives me pride to be here. Um, and so I, I just think that that's the space where we probably need to do uh, more work as a society and at Penn. Thank you. The next question we have here, and I'm not sure who would like to take this one on, I think um, perhaps from the, the student perspective, is, is Penn a safe and welcoming environment for everyone, despite race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation? I know it's a big one to sort of bite off, but I do think, especially the year that we've been through and the history that we've all lived through, that um, it's certainly something that I think is a valid question and it's one that um, people would like to hear firsthand and you know, sort, of, sort of from a candid perspective as well. Is anybody willing to? Uh, I can do that if I, remember, if I remember the question, question correctly, but I think, there are networks of support everywhere. Um, and those that can come from, you know, the institution itself, it can come from um, professors, it can come from the clubs or activities that you do, and it can come from like just individual people. So yes, um, there is always support at, at Penn and Penn, you know, tries to support people. Um, Penn is also just like a microcosm of the world. So, you know, you're gonna experience things, uh, but there's support everywhere. And whether that be your friends, you know, there's always someone to, to lean on, which I think is like the most important thing uh, because you're never gonna have like a perfectly safe and institution that's just not, yeah, it's not feasible, but you know, you, you, the networks of support are there somewhere. And I think that's what's most important. Thank you, Ashley. The next question um, has to do with sororities and how do those impact and uplift um, the perspective of Latinx or minority communities in Pennsylvania and other parts of the United States, um, both impact inside and outside of the campus? Um, so yeah, I think um, there's definitely two kind of different, I think, Greek perspectives on, on Penn's campus. Um, I'm very fortunate to be part of the intercultural um, perspective to where there's a, there's a large um, kind of, I, I wouldn't say like bouquet, but kind of like a bouquet um, of organizations that people can learn about and become a part of. Um, the multicultural ones, they're very focused on, you know, uplifting the community and like collaboration. And there's just like a very unique community just within mm -hmm. um, that field or within that environment as a whole. Um, while there are, you know, like a lot of stories about Greek life in general and um, pre m like majorly um, like the negative stories that are kind of like um, connotated with those, I think still just having an experience where you're able to relate to a lot of people with similar backgrounds, but also like going through an experience that you can also relate to is something very unifying and um, extends to a lot of different fields. So, you know, if you can apply it to your academic pursuits, your extracurriculars and just overall um, personal experiences. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna do one more question and then sort of get back to a closing question. Um, and this one really has to do, I believe with um, mental health and thinking about what outlets 
does the, does Penn offer to women specifically um, by people of color regarding mental health and building a flourishing community mentally? Again, another chat, really challenging, but also I think one that's sort of sits at the top of people's minds when thinking about um, you know the college experience. Yeah, so Penn has uh, its counseling and psychology services caps um, and they're great. They're always a resource um, an encouraged resource to go to whether or not you think you need the help. It's always good to just um, be preemptive with it. Um, and you know, just have the, having the people to talk to there is great. Um, you can specify who you want to talk to. If you want to talk to a woman, a black woman, you know, whoever you want to talk to, you can get there. Um, and I think that's, that's a great way to really tailor um, your experience to what you feel most comfortable with. Uh, and they also do things outside of just counseling and psychology itself. So I know my sorority uh, partnered with them for an event on just like the effects of COVID um, as, a, as a black student, you know, dealing with COVID as a black student. So I think they're great. Um, I think other networks of support will also highlight mental health. Um, Maku highlights mental health a lot and, you know, they'll host uh, either programs or, you know, study spaces. Um, Aku itself is a physical space, so that's another avenue where you can uh, go and just relax. I think uh, professors are good for the most part about, um, you know, being uh, aware of the reality of whatever situation you're in. If you talk to them, um, you know, they'll be understanding, uh, but that's also, you know, about you being preemptive again and, you know, reaching out to them. So I would say that yeah, it has a lot of, there's a, there are a lot of networks of support uh, as a Black student, as a Black female student, um, you know, in terms of mental health. Thank you. And Lauren, I think you had unmuted. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. I was going to add something really quick. Um, just being at Penn in general, there is a lot that can weigh on your mental health. I know also just being in Warren, there is a very intense pre-professional culture. Um, but I would advise for anyone to just reach out, I guess, to administration, to people who run certain student groups, um, either at the Women's Center, for me, it's Natives at Penn, and these are people who are genuinely looking out for you, who care about your well-being, who will make the time out of the week to just listen to what you have to say, um, to always to support you, and so finding those small groups of people, of uh, faculty members who are really willing to help you has carried me a long way and has often just given me a fresh a breath of air um, from the rigorous academic um, time at Penn. Thank you so much. And we're getting close to the end of our time. So I'm gonna ask one last question and ask for a, a brief answer, um, but really what um, professional or personal words of wisdom would you like to impart on the attendees today? And Michelle, if we can start with you, just quick words of advice or wisdom here. So if any of you are uh, decide to, to come to Penn Engineering and you're a female and this is what you'll hear me say um, to every incoming class, be hungry for thoughts and new ideas, make mistakes so that you can be the one to uncover the solutions, be open to new experiences, develop risk tolerance, and be a disruptor. Thank you. And I'll go to Monta. So uh, my general reflection for anyone is, um, I want you all to remember, you know, we think of our, our existence as in our own lifetime. I want you to think of your existence as a miracle. I want you to think of you, your existence as multiple generations had dreams that you exist as dreams come true. And so when you think of yourself as this gift of abundance, you know, all of the fears, all of those things that are real, like th there's, there's strength that is supporting you and that your wisdom, you know, your wisdom will carry you through. Um, we are so excited, you know, for, uh, you know, for, for you to be part of the Penn community. Um, and, and at Penn, you're going to learn different forms of knowledge, but you come with wisdom and only you have the wisdom you have. So I would ask that you think about what the combination of your lifelong wisdom and, and the knowledge you gain here together, um, you will be unstoppable. And I just want you to have faith in that. Thank you. And Ashley, as the most senior of our, our students. Yeah, um, I would tell you to make your experience what you want it. Um, 
Penn is only the place it is today because there were people to, who fought for it. Um, a lot of them were students. So, you know, you have power as a student, um, your voice matters, and as they always say, uh, but yeah, make your experience what you want it to be. And if there's, a, there's you know, something that you find lacking, um, don't be afraid to, to speak out about it. Thank you. And Melina? Um, I would definitely say to take the time to explore who you truly are. Um, being away from home is a very opportune um, time to explore your actual passions, your interests, and identities that you probably weren't able to um, explore, you know, under your household, wherever you call home. So um, it's a very enriching experience being able to be part of new things. So um, always put yourself first and explore what you want to. Thank you so much. And finally, Lauren. Yeah, my advice is um, to just always be confident in yourself, to always bet on yourself. Um, there's going to be challenging times, um, but I just want you to remember to just always have the confidence that you're able to do things. Remember everything that you've accomplished um, because it's going to take you further than what you think you can do now. Wonderful. I want to say Wanishi, which is how I say thank you on the Nape. I thank you to the panelists for giving so generously of your time, especially now and especially with the students in the middle of midterms. If you have any left, I want to wish you good luck. I want to also honor the important role models that inspired these prominent Penn women. Um, if you noticed on their um, slides at the beginning, they all mentioned someone. And so a lot of them mentioned their moms, uh, Matilda Louise Tolson, Eloise Cabell, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Toni Morrison, and too many others to count. And so we wanna to continue to uplift each other. And thank you also for joining us this evening. I hope that wherever you are in the world that you and your loved ones are doing well. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague and also a quick thank you too for Carol and Zoe and Kadara behind the scenes answering your questions. Um, and I'm gonna pass it off to Carol um, for the closing statements. Thank you. Thank you again. We really appreciate the time that you're giving us um, of your evenings or mornings or afternoons for wherever you're coming from. And again, another thank you to our panelists. You were all amazing. Thank you for sharing your stories. Of course, thank you to Tina, who was our moderator today. Really appreciate the insightful words that she had to say. Hopefully you're seeing my slides on the Women's Center. We wanted to provide this resource as we are celebrating Women's History Month. We wanted to make you aware of this resource that is on campus. Uh, the Penn Women's Center was founded in 1973 and provides opportunities to really celebrate and encourage women on, Penn, on Penn's campus. They also do a lot to fight for gender violence and gender equity. Um, we have organizations like the Penn Violence Prevention Center, PAGE, which is the Penn Association of Gender and Equity, and PAVE, which is the Penn Anti-Violence Educators. We also have events uh, hosted on campus through them, which are the Penn Monologues, um, kind of our rendition of Vagina Monologues on campus, Take Back the Night, and also our Own It Summit, which provides professional development opportunities for women on Penn's campus. Um, I'll be sharing those resources in the chat before logging off. Um, so please, uh, hopefully I can do that. I don't think I can actually copy it, um, but, uh, We'll try, try our best to do that before we end the night. And last but not least, um, please connect with us um, in admissions. Um, we have a lot of our workshops are on YouTube. We have social media and we try to really share relevant events like this um, so that you can learn more about Penn on your journey. Thank you all once again, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night.